Okay, so as Chris said, I am Helena. I'm here to talk about Galaxy Training Network and accessibility. Uh, accessibility is a very broad topic, and we've been working on it within our community for a long time, and we'll continue to be working on it for a long time in the future. So what does accessibility mean to you? When we talk about the word accessibility, there are a lot of common definitions of this. There is the classic, like, is it accessible for people with disabilities? It, can you view this content if you have, you know, impaired color vision? If you have any auditory issues or cognitive issues, really access for people who need extra features to enable barrier-free access. But those aren't the only kinds of accessibility. And oftentimes when you hear about accessibility in a training context, they're really talking about the second point, uh, accessibility for people with geographic barriers or financial barriers, able to reach training events or reach the training materials themselves or reach the trainers. Or they maybe are from one of the lower medium income countries and need extra assistance in order to reach these training materials and resources that we've created that are really exciting. You know, We're all really excited about all the work we've done and we wanna share it with the world. So how can we get that out there to those people facing those, those issues? Uh, and lastly, there's a bit of a learning methods accessibility question. This is a less common definition, I would say, but how accessible is a specific piece of material to a learner? So accessibility is a long, long road. When you start to think about accessibility and, you know, am I making all of my resources, all of my websites, all of my courses accessible to the entire world or, you know, to the local audience in your local area? It's not really going to be a point where you say, yes, I am 100% accessible and I'm done and I don't have to do it anymore. You're always going to be able to find improvements that you can make that will make your content better for people who have those access needs. Um, when you look at a lot of the reports from automated tools, which we'll see in a little bit, those can be very black and white. They can say you're passing or failing. And even when you're passing all of those automated reports, even when you're passing the local accessibility um, czar of your university, I know some colleagues had issues getting certain resources past those. And they say, really, OK, well, you're not passing at all. And well, there's a whole lot of different aspects to it. There's a whole lot of different axes to are you accessible in this way, this way, or this way? Who are you targeting? Who will be consuming your content? Need to be answered before you can say, am I really accessible? And it, it takes a long time to get there. So I don't know, prepare yourself for that a bit. So we're going to start by talking about the more traditional accessibility term, the accessibility that at least in the US is covered under Americans with Disability Act. There are a patchwork framework of laws in the EU, I believe, to cover this. I do not know the case for the UK anymore. Um, but requiring that resources that are put online are accessible. So within the GTN, we've put a lot of work into this, into at least three main pillars of accessibility that are important to us and that we feel we can contribute to significantly. So with all of the training material, the Galaxy Training Network's content, uh, we make sure we test it with a screen reader. I personally use TalkBack on Android. It's fantastic. You get used to it after a while, and you can be quite efficient with it. Um, but it still takes manual testing. We also test for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG. There are two different levels of this. There's AA and AAA, AAA being the stronger, higher level of accessibility requirements. And when we do automated testing regularly to ensure that we're meeting this. Additionally, for visual accessibility, some people have issues with content that's too bright or content that where the background is too dark with very bright to light text on it. So we make sure that we have a couple of different themes, including a dark mode and a lights out mode with really black background and a non black background, which is just a very dark gray because there are people with astigmatism and other ocular issues that this helps. This makes a better experience for them. Second pillar, of course, is auditory threats. Uh, we are slowly branching out into the world of online, you know, video recordings, audio recordings of tutorials. And this takes the lion's share of the work, I would say. With all the tutorial content that we've put online, we have ensured that we have manually captioned it. It's, I think, 99% compliant within the, the smorgasbord content. So when we were talking about the smorgasbord event series that we've been running, 
over those three years, we've produced something like 120, 200 hours of video. And we've said, OK, all of this needs to be accessible to people who want to use it. And every year, we've gotten feedback from the learners saying, thank you, making this accessible. Let me attend this event. Let me participate fully. And they are very, very appreciative of that. And that's somehow considered a high bar, but really should be the bare minimum, that if you're putting video content online, like this video content, I hope we can caption it after the fact. I'd be happy to help there. Um, that when you put this content online, it needs to have good human reviewed captions. The automated captions of YouTube are not good. They are, they're okay, they're getting better, but it's a long road to get better. And human captions are the, the standard. You can start with automated captions, which we do. And then you can also go in completely different directions like we've done with the slides to video here that's mentioned here. So within the Galaxy Training Network, we have a lot of slide decks, right? And a lot of recordings of these slide decks actually where an expert presents their knowledge about this topic with the slide deck. So what we did is we combined those two things. We took all of the words said by the human, we put them into the slides, and then we automatically extracted the contents out of that. We turned that into an audio track, a video recording of tapping through the slides, and then we put that together in a video, which we know as a result has perfect captions because we're taking the captions directly from what audio would be generated. We use a machine learning model to generate some audio from the text. And this gives us perfectly captioned videos. So at least for this, we are no, we know we're hundred percent compliant on that, on that facet. We know we've got good results there. Um, doesn't apply to all workflows, but if you have a lot of slide content that you are finding yourself turning into short videos, consider automatic pipelines because they make the captioning work go away. And it's really nice. Um, all automated or auditory content that we have on the training materials, which is again, only recordings of the training videos. We also make the subtitles files and a transcript available. So this goes a little bit away from auditory into other aspects of accessibility, but having the content available in the user's preferred format is something that's really nice for them. I know personally, I am not a video tutorial person. I cannot stand them, uh, but I love reading text because I can skim through it a lot faster. So for me personally, having a transcript makes content a lot more accessible to me. It makes sure that I'll actually engage with it. And then thirdly, on the cognitive aspect, there are things you can do with your website that can make it easier and more pleasant for people with cognitive impairments to access your training content. Uh, prefers reduced motion is a big one. This is also for people with vestibular issues. So having strong animations, strong animated buttons, animations, things flying in and flying out as you move through the content, this can be suboptimal for people with those issues. And having, but that doesn't mean you have to give them up completely. There is a feature called prefers reduced motion, which can be supported in browsers. And you can mark all of that animated content as such and say, OK, I want this to stop moving if you are a person with that has disabled this. Uh, and that way you can have the best of both worlds there a bit. But it does mean a little bit of extra work to make sure you're checking all of the animations on your site. Personally, I enable prefers reduced motion absolutely everywhere I can because it makes all of my devices a little bit faster. I don't need 500 seconds of animation. And as a result, I've also discovered a lot of websites and services over the years that do not work with that. Spotify's Wrapped was actually a notable one. This is the first year that Spotify's Wrapped in my memory has functioned for me. Every other year, it tried to load the animations and on Android, they are blocked completely. And it just crashed without any error message, which was really unhelpful. But they've finally gotten around to supporting preferred reduced motion properly, and it's a lot better. So also no autoplaying videos, no sounds when you can avoid it or having this be a toggle. Mostly no autoplaying auto playing videos is taken care of free by the major browser vendors. They all forbid autoplaying videos uh, with a couple of exceptions. They have some algorithm that says, is this site allowed to play videos automatically based off of a user's behavior? And so that's mostly not an issue these days. So when we talk about testing for visual accessibility, so this is sort of, do you have a visual impairment and you need to access the content? But this goes beyond that, of course, because people who don't have those impairments also benefit from these improvements. We have a lot of automatic testing tools available to us. We have Wave and Axe, which I'll talk about shortly. 
There is this Power Mapper Pro. This is one that uh, the Open University folks always send us links to whenever we fail their tests. There are also other linters. So if you are really responsible for the infrastructure, you can look into making sure all of these tests are automatic. On the other hand, there is manual testing. You can see I've bolded it. It is not optional. It is really mandatory. If you want your content to be accessible, just running it through all of these automated tests, unfortunately, won't be enough to make sure that the content is actually accessible. There's a lot more that isn't caught by these tools that are running automatically and that really are only detectable if you are experiencing it through that access method. If you have a budget, there is this lovely series of persona profiles where um, the UK government actually, when they worked on their website redesign, they developed a series of Chrome profiles for the browser Chrome, which can be installed on say a Chromebook or a laptop and give the experience of someone experiencing some of those impairments or disabilities. And of course, it's not an accurate or full representation of their lived experiences, but it does let you as a web developer experience a little bit closer to what they may see your website as or see your training materials as. We don't have that budget, so we don't get to do that, but oh well. Learn to using, use your screen reader. This is something absolutely anyone can do. Every single one of you probably has a cell phone sitting, if not in your hand, then nearby you can learn to use a screen reader. It's really not hard at all. It takes some practice. You'll generally have to go through a tutorial on Android at least, you're forced to go through a tutorial, which is very helpful. And then you can learn to use the screen reader. It's really not difficult and it will give you sort of firsthand experience of how can I engage with my content or my tutorials. And this is something I personally do. I also use a screen reader. I occasionally have uh, migraines, right? And I don't want to bright lights, but I still want to use my phone because I'm an addicted phone millennial. Uh, so I learned to use a screen reader and it's really not bad at all. This is what Wave looks like. Wave is a nice browser extension that you can install. It's also, I believe, a website you can use separately if you don't want the browser extension. And you can see here that it's highlighted a bunch of different stuff for us. It's highlighted some uh, elements. You can see the H1s and H2s. These let you see how the content is structured. It'll also call out things like issues with whether or not you are using the right heading levels. Here you can see we've done a great job, zero errors, zero contrast errors. Uh, if you have significant errors with, you know, okay, you've used the wrong heading elements or heading elements out of order, you've used invisible components that aren't going to be contrasting enough for users, it'll call out all of these. And it's nice, I use it every once in a while, I click the little button in my browser just to say, hey, are we still passing via this tool? This is the power mapper that, again, Open University often sends us links to. Here they've found some more issues with our site. Um, they cert the free version, the trial version, is limited 10 pages, which, okay, fine, especially for a website like a training or tutorial resource where you really have a couple of types of content. You've got a main page and then you've got the tutorial pages and maybe topic listings. Uh, it can give you a good overview of things that they have found. Whether or not all of these meet your definitions of accessibility issues, some of them can be up to debate and some of them are really relatively minor. They use the red here for more significant issues. You can go, go look at the tool, try it out, let us know what you think. Um, Aix, Aix is a Ax. I don't know how to pronounce this, sorry. Uh, it's a command line tool that we have integrated into our GitHub Actions pipeline. So whenever someone makes a pull request to the Galaxy training materials, we are automatically testing against all of these different pages as sort of a representative sample. It takes a little bit of time to run and it'll give you out some nice reports like this. Here is a report for the homepage of the training materials where it's found some issues with this iframe. You can see YTP title channel. It's some issues that it's found with YouTube and Beb that we have got on the homepage. And since this is an iframe, it's completely outside of our ability to control it, in fact. So there's not much we can do about this, but we could try removing that embedded YouTube link and we could instead link to YouTube 
to decrease these errors, but this is also, this is somewhat expected. Uh, I like the note that comes with running X. Please note that only 20 to 50% of all accessibility issues can be automatically detected. You'll find issues that all of the syntax is right, all of the markup is right, but if you are to try and use it in a screen reader, you're going to struggle, you're going to have troubles. So this is why everyone, not just me, says that, okay, manual testing is really a key factor in making your content accessible. So there's also keyboard accessibility. So people who are maybe not using a screen reader but don't have full use of their hands often navigate with just their keyboard. This is something also anyone can test. Anyone in your organization can go say, can I navigate my website with the keyboard and nothing else? Keyboard, tab, the tab key, the enter key, and the space bar. And for most, I will say, not super interactive websites, this is sufficient and you can test it. You can make sure it works. Um, here you can see in the screenshot, the bottom is Firefox's inspector. It has a checkbox for show tabbing order. And this lets you also see visually is every component that I'm looking at reachable via tab and in what order. The tab order is very important as you could be going through your content in an illogical or you know the wrong way. And you don't really want to do this. You want to make your content accessible in a very logical ordering. And the tab order controls that. So this is something that usually is right. Usually it's OK, but it's something you should check just to make sure. But yeah, most websites you can completely interact with with just a couple of keys and then the rest of the keyboard for any forms you have to fill out. Doing this with something like Galaxy is a lot more complicated. So uh, also, is it clear what element you clicked on? When you are navigating with the keyboard, there is this CSS outline property, which controls the display of the currently tabbed element. It's great for highlighting what you're currently clicked on. Uh, you can highlight it in red, for instance, like this, just to make it really visually clear and stand out from your background, what you're currently selected. Uh, the default in Bootstrap 3 is a little bit suboptimal. But hopefully we can replace that with something brighter and more red like this sometime soon. But yes, is anything unclickable is also important. We notably had something that was unclickable on one of our JavaScript enabled components, which I'll get back to later. But JavaScript introduces a lot of accessibility challenges. Everything that you worked with gets a little bit harder, but you have to be a little bit more careful with JavaScript. And one of our things that we introduced to training materials was a copy button for all of the preformatted code blocks. So everywhere we wanted someone to run a command, we'd say, yeah, just copy that. And you'd give them an easy button to click. But this was hard to click if you were navigating with just a keyboard. OK, so stepping away from visual accessibility for a second, there's also cognitive accessibility. And we talked a bit about the prefers reduced motion at the start. But there's also other features like making sure that the user knows what they're doing and has easy links to remind themselves if they don't remember off the top of their head. This is something I personally notice more as I age, especially with video games. I will put down a game that I am loving, enjoying every second of for a week, a month, because life is too busy. And when I get back to that, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't remember the key bindings. I don't remember how to function in that world. Um, and this is just part of getting older. This will affect absolutely everyone. And having reminders, having checkpoints, having you know checklists. So have you done this, this, and this can be really helpful to people experiencing those issues. And here you can see examples of our FAQs. Not everyone needs the FAQ when they go to do a Galaxy tutorial. Maybe they've used Galaxy before and they are actively working with it every day. They don't need to create a new history tip box. They just know what to do. They don't need to be reminded of how to import for links. So that's why we have all of these integrated throughout every tutorial saying, OK, do you maybe not remember? Great, that's no worries. Here's a tip box to tell you step by step what you need to do. And that's also why we focus really heavily on numbered step-by-step -step instructions, really hands-on practical steps. So 
anyone who is has whatever going on in their life can still follow along with our materials and say, okay, even if I got distracted during the step, I can still, I know where I am. I know what I need to do next. And we see this also, I mean, even with tutorials I write, I see this, that I don't consider people who might be facing those issues. And I don't always think about that. I think, oh, of course they'll know X, Y, and Z. Um, so that's why when you are thinking about accessibility and thinking about this, have colleagues help out and consider reading through to say, hey, did you actually explain this well enough? Did you remind them of this and this? Or did you just say, yeah, it's fine? So cognitive accessibility also just isn't just for learners. When we are talking about adding these features to the site, the GTN spent a lot of time also documenting all of our schemas. We have about six different YAML schemas for each of the different content types that are part of the GTN. And making those you know, easily discoverable and accessible. I heard last week that someone was actually actively using these as reference material. And it was, made me so happy. It was just like, yes, OK, this was, this was useful. Um, we spent time documenting all of our tools and all of our frameworks. Uh, we spent time documenting all of the code that's part of the training network just to say, OK, if another contributor comes in, can they figure out enough? And I know we still have huge gaps on that side, more so on the you know, contributor side than we do on the learner side. But hopefully, we're making improvements there. It's also why we spent a lot of time writing Act, um, these sort of hands-on guides for, okay, how do you want to contribute a tutorial? How do you contribute a slide deck? How do you make this change or that change? And they're all really written as hands-on, do this, do this, do this. And okay, sometimes we need to make that into a didactic moment so it becomes a question with a solution box. But that's also why all of our question boxes have solutions because there's not always a teacher there. You might not be able to puzzle it out yourself. So having a solution that you can access and say, okay, for whatever reason, I don't have time, I don't have energy, et cetera. You can still have access to the full content. So multiple formats. This is something that I guess gets to be more of an issue over time. Um, when we were first putting our slides online, we received feedback from someone on Twitter saying, hey, please link to plain text versions. Please link to directly to the markdown. Even that's better than all of these terrible JavaScript slide frameworks. And that's that's very fair. Like All of the interfaces between JavaScript and websites make things more complicated. And oftentimes, people will find that they are not as accessible. So what we do with that, our solution to that, so to speak, is to make all of our content as accessible as possible in multiple formats. Here we take our of our slides, which start their life as a markdown document. We generate really a plain text version with all of the styling stripped out, just the images, just, just the data, just the text and the speaker notes. And we make those available and we link them from each slide deck. We also link to the markdown if you want to see just the plain markdown, if that's better if you read markdown. Um, we also try and make all of our content available on an API. So if there is a different format that would be better for someone, they should have, in our theory, have access to that data in whatever format, in a machine readable format maybe, so that they can put it into a better format for them. Uh, the comparison here, of course, is with Reddit. They are currently in the process of shutting down third-party applications. They've increased API fees so significantly that most third-party apps are quitting. And this means that the blind subreddit, which was so heavily reliant on third-party applications because the first-party application, Reddit's Android and Apple or iPhone app, were so terrible for accessibility that without these third-party applications that actually made efforts and cared about accessibility, then they don't they don't care. So they have to shut down. It's really unfortunate. So when you make training materials, when the GTN makes training materials, we're really trying to think about how can we make these accessible to people in what whatever format works best for them. Uh, we're considering making automatic PDF exports available. However, PDF is notorious for its problems with accessibility, and making an accessible PDF is an actual nightmare. I spent a couple of days trying to make my thesis, my PhD thesis, accessible. And 
at the end, I have given up. It would be easier just to remake my thesis entirely in HTML than it would be to make an accessible PDF. The requirements for that, especially in LaTeX, are significant. So we're going to explore other formats. There's also EPUB for people who want to read in their Kindle. Can't imagine why, but there are some people who do. Fantastic. We're happy for them. And there's also this Kiwix format. Um, it's mostly notable for allowing you to host a local copy of Wikipedia, which is great for people with geographic accessibility issues or internet accessibility issues that they can download a local copy of a resource and have access to it. So again, to wrap this up, we're trying to make the training materials available in formats that work for people. And here are our slides as examples of that. On the left, you can see our slides. We link to the plain text slides directly. All of this comes from Markdown, which is also accessible. And then for the ones that are turned into videos, they are also available as videos with transcripts. And we're really trying to have this sort of spectrum of if you want plain text, great, there you go. If you want an interactive document, also available. If you want a video recording, maybe also available because those take, of course, more work. But we're trying and hopefully it's useful to people. We do the same, of course, with tutorials, especially for our coding focused ones. We've written our own Markdown to Jupyter and our Markdown document converter. So whenever people write training materials, they are then, of course, available as plain text Markdown, but they also are available as an interactive Jupyter notebook or an R Markdown document. So whenever possible, we've been trying to make additional formats of interactive tutorials available. There are even a couple of our Python tutorials that are available in the browser. So you don't have to download anything. You don't have to install anything. You don't have to go to MyBinder or to the, um, use Galaxy in order to start up a notebook, but you can just try out the training materials directly. It's not possible for everything. It requires a lot of technical infrastructure, but it's a neat thing that might be possible. Here are the plain text slides where we've really extracted just slide by slide. All of them have a horizontal rule between them. It doesn't always work perfectly, but it gives you an idea of, okay, we're trying to make this available in a different format that might be useful for someone. So audio accessibility. Fortunately, again, we don't have so much video content. We're not a primarily video content platform, but this is growing over time and it's a very popular format. It brings in a lot of, you know, new users who might not discover the training materials otherwise. So if we're going to do it, we're going to do it properly, right? And thus we have the guidelines, all the content needs to be subtitled and all of it needs to be human reviewed. There are new models. So when we put videos online, we usually use YouTube. We also use AWS's Transcribe. Both of these are, they're okay. Um, there is the new Whisper model from OpenAI to do the automatic subtitling. And this is, Whisper is a lot better for us than YouTube and AWS's Transcribe, but okay, it's still not perfect. It's still missing important features that need to be added. Things like sentence breaks. Um, so all subtitles as a result need to be human reviewed is our conclusion. Uh, subtitling our own content is a lot faster which is why I offered Chris to subtitle these at the end for you. Um, if you know what you said, you recorded this recently, you can, and you have, you know, okay, good automatic subtitles as a baseline. You can, if you're good, get up to one to 1 1.5 times the length of the video in order that much time needs to be spent to review the captions. If you are new to captioning, it can take two to three times the length of the video, which is a large price to pay, I know. Um, but it's getting better with the new models, with the new machine learning transcription models. And it's all faster, of course, if you can do the completely automatic version and you're not recording the slides manually each time. It's, it's a big cost. And this is one of the things that I see a lot of people when we talk about accessibility say, okay, I don't wanna pay that. I am not interested in that. But it's something every year when we run Smorgasbord, we hear people say, thank you for doing captions. It's not normal, but we're but it, it helps that person. And you know, how can you say no to that? 
There's also, if you're living in specific places, a legal requirement to do this that a lot of people miss, especially in the US education system. A lot of people, I think, miss that there is an ADA requirement to subtitle your content, especially if you're making it available online for a class. But yeah. Okay, visual accessibility. Another thing that affects me, I'm red, green, colorblind. So when you are making new materials, consider trying to go through all of your website. Can we do this with our, the GTN to go through our site with no color, with completely monochromatic. This is the most rare type of colorblindness. However, it gives you the best feeling of, am I using color and color alone to convey something important? And if you are, you can say, okay, there is a spot I need a text label or an icon, something else to convey the meaning that's supposed to be associated with that color. In the G10, we have like a couple different types of boxes. We have like the agenda box, the question, the solution box. And a lot of those would, if, would be indicated only by color, except we have labels and icons that go with them to say, this is a question and solution box. Um, and thus those are accessible even with no color vision. If you are making plots, there are lots of different colorblind accessible plot palettes that you can use. Um, here are Veritas, I think is one of the most common ones. And it's a simple change you can make. It may not be your favorite color palette, but it's a more accessible one. So please consider it. But yeah, Firefox's development tools have actually gotten quite good here. You can see that you can simulate all of these different kinds of colorblindness just directly in the browser. I'm not sure Chrome's have all the same feature. So within the training materials, we also offer multiple themes. Here is a picture for those of you who do development of GitHub's theming options. Um, there are the dark and light theme options. You can sync these with the user's system. Uh, there are, there is a preference, prefers color scheme, like prefers reduced motion which indicates whether the user says, I want a dark or light theme. This is great for you know, users' devices, which might be automatically moving to dark mode when it gets to be the end of the day or moving to light mode in the day or changing to light mode when you move outside. These are, and this can be automatic on your site as a result. So we currently don't do this in the GTN because I need to find a good way to handle the preference. But it's the plan in the future that there will be an automatic option that will switch back and forth between light and dark. You'll notice here in the GitHub screenshot that they also have a couple different aspects of accessibility. They have a high contrast mode, which is useful for people with reduced um, contrast. There is also a protonopia, deuteranopia, and tridenopia color scheme. And those are great color schemes to have. The thing I really struggle with about GitHub is that they make you choose between high contrast and deuteranopia and protonopia. And I, I would like both. So we are redesigning the training material theme selection. And well, whenever I need something to distract myself from my PhD thesis, um, we'll be redesigning it to have these as independent axes where you can select, do you want high contrast or low contrast? or neutral contrast. Do you want a light dark background, dark background, or automatic? And then do you want any of the theme components on top of that? So the other type of visual impairment that you may have personally experienced is contrast loss. If you are reading resources outside, if you are on your phone, you know, in the train or on a nice day outside and you just want to enjoy the nice weather after cold and dreary winter, you may have found yourself struggling to read your material. And this is a problem I experience every day with the Switch because it's a device that's meant to be handheld and carried around with you, but it is absolutely terrible in the contrast department. And there are things I do not play because it has such poor contrast outside. So Again, with the Firefox development tools, there is a contrast loss option. Consider it, give it a go, make sure you can at least find your way through your content and that you can read some of it. We test outside regularly because we have a nice backyard, so we go sit out there. We notice these things then. So these are all things that really are easy to test. And when you are you know, implementing 
accessibility in your framework. Like there's a lot of things and they're all different aspects, but so, so many of them are things that are easy to test and that you yourself can test. Things like testing with a screen reader, things like the colorblindness filters, things like using only a keyboard. Um, here's a small page of tips. Uh, the ones I want to also highlight here, of course, is reduce JavaScript. You can use JavaScript and be accessible, but it takes extra work. And so that's why, at least on the training material side, we try and make sure that at least all of the key content works without JavaScript. We have a couple of features that don't, and OK. Most of it, though, we can make work. When you are using frameworks, these can also help, um, rather than just you know hand picking every color. But I guess a lot of you work for big universities and you know maybe have brand guidelines that you need to follow or so. So using a framework can at least force developers, force content authors into using accessible colors by default. So I know it's been a long talk. I will speed through the next bits. Um, then there's the other kind of accessibility we mentioned at the start, the ones that are not protected classes. So things like geographic accessibility. This graphic on our right was from a study conducted of access to higher learning and education institutes of various flavors in Italy. And you can see there are a lot of regions that do not have close accessible higher education institutions. So when we are thinking about online materials, that's why the GTN at least is so online forward, online first, all of our materials are available everywhere because geographic barriers are a major impediment. When we started the Smorgasbord event series, that was one of the big things we saw was we reached hundreds of countries that we have never reached before. That all of our, you know, we spent time training people in Europe and this, does not meet the rest of the world. This keeps all of the learning inside our local community, which is maybe not ideal. And we noticed this also with moving to the smorgasbord model, that we are moving from a model where we would spend environmental costs, we would spend hundreds and hundreds of euros to fly the key personnel around Europe. And now we can say, okay, all of our stuff is online. It's completely barrier-free access in terms of geographic accessibility. There is also the visa issue. Um, if any of you have tried to travel to the US and are not American, I hear it is quite, quite, quite unpleasant. And I'm very sorry for that. Uh, lots of conferences continue to be hosted there, though. And they just say, sorry, you're out of luck if you're one of the countries that it takes 6, 12 months to get a visa for. One of my colleagues in my lab um, is currently in the process of trying to get a visa to visit the US. And they're from Romania. This has been a like 12 month saga for them, which terribly unpleasant. And if the conference was online, it wouldn't have been an issue. Next up, our financial accessibility. So when you're talking about events and training events, this is again, another reason that we have moved online and we are staying online is that training could be super expensive. It, there are costs for the travel, there's costs for the food, for the visa, for the food. And a lot of universities have this really terrible practice of making the students float the cost and requiring the students to essentially give the university an interest-free loan for two, three months while they decide to pay them back. And students don't always have this money, which means that making your content available online, making your trainings available online, you can reach a lot of these students that would not have been able to reach it otherwise, a lot of especially early career students. So the solutions for this, of course, are make it free. All, all of us work in high income countries. We can get grants. We can provide differential pricing to people in low and middle income countries. There's a nice list where we can say, hey, are you from this country? Great, you get a discount with the registration. And we've been doing our best to implement this in all of our training events. Speaking of people from outside the EU, from outside the UK and other English speaking countries, Native English speakers um, have a negative effect on conversations a lot of the time. There is data to back this up. The first link is for NPR, the second for BBC. So they're not you know, scientific articles, but there is data to back that up that when Native English speakers like myself enter a conversation, this can be a negative. Um, 
especially because a lot of us are, to start with, not good communicators in English, and we use a lot of idioms and metaphors. And if you have international colleagues, maybe you've already worked on this. Maybe you've already made an effort to, you know, speak better international English, as it's called. Um, it is a challenge, especially in training materials, though, and it's something that you have to review for. So with English, when you when we do write our training materials in English, there is the Galaxy training material is, is overwhelmingly English. There are a couple of Spanish and French language tutorials written by native speakers. We do our best to ensure it's correct. And as a result, hope that the machine learning translation of that will be improved. This is something that one of our colleagues from Open University was working on with a student that to say, OK, uh, is machine learning translation, how does it compare to human translation to completely untranslated and saying, OK, are, is it good enough that we can accept it? And the machine learning translation is getting really, really a lot better. It still struggles sometimes, but it is improving over time. So when you do use English, we try and make sure that we are writing it as correctly as we can. And that when we are reviewing training materials, we are checking for language, checking for idioms, checking for cultural specific phrases and metaphors. All of these are issues. And one of the other alternative solutions is to just step out of the way and let the non-native English speakers lead the push on producing content because they have spent years speaking international English, communicating effectively in a second language. They know this language probably better than most native speakers do. They can be good authors of content. Not to push that work onto them, of course, but if they are available for that, it is definitely a useful contribution. So we also try and have people from different backgrounds review our content within the training materials. It's led by Saskia, myself, and a French woman, Berenice. We also have a lot of colleagues from around Germany, France, UK, Denmark, things like this. And having this international team, we think, helps us improve our content. Because we can say, OK, when we're talking about these tutorials and learning materials, that they've been reviewed by someone with a different background, someone who might be able to call out any potential issues, any you know, weird sports metaphors that people have inserted, things like this. It all helps to improve the tutorials. Moving into format accessibility, uh, this is the very last part of my talk, and then I'll be done. Um, learning styles is a big concept in education. It is complete nonsense. Um, there was always this theory that, oh, people have a personal learning style. This is something I heard growing up in yeah, high school and later on in university, that there was a learning style that was best for me, whether it was visual or auditory or so on. There's no evidence for this, but the myth persists and some of the learners are going to be more engaged with content if it's in a format they prefer. Whether or not that helps them learn better, separate issue, but they prefer it. So you can look into where possible generating content, different formats. So here again, going back to what we said earlier, that we have content that's available in tutorial format or in video format. And students who prefer one or the other, they can choose what works best for them. When we ran Smorgasbord, we asked in cheer, what are the videos use format? Because we, as tutorial authors, weren't sure about this. We were saying, well, you know, we've only ever done text-based tutorials. These are bread and butter. They are what we really love and we think works best. We're also the type of people who prefer text tutorials where we can skim through to get to just, bit, just the bits we want because we also have a good grasp of the concept, which is biasing us a lot. So we asked the students, you know, is this a good format for you? Overwhelmingly positive. When we asked which formats they used, OK, we can see distribution, but it does skew a bit to the video that people are using all of the available resources. So here, three is really 50% text, 50% video is what they use to follow the course. And these are people who were happy to have both. They had all of this content available to them in a format that worked for them based on the day, based on their preferences at the time, etc. So, you know, it's a lot of extra work, but we had really good feedback about it. So wanted to share that with you.
There's a couple other small GTN features, namely learning pathways and search. We're rewriting our search to be a bit more comprehensible, a bit easier to find content in. And we're adding learning pathways. We've already added them, which give you really step-by-step, step, do this, do this, do this. And this, again, goes to the cognitive overload that you're not faced with 300 plus tutorials that you might want to look through. You can really say, hey, that one sounds, this, this learning path sounds interesting. And it steps you through bit by bit what you need to do with, okay, slides, hands-on, or recordings if they're available. This is what we want to promote and what we think can be really useful for people. So with that, thank you. Let me know if there are any questions.